One of the greatest underdog stories uh, has to be the story of of Mary, the teenage girl who had become the mother of the Son of God. In fact, if I were doing like a March Madness of the Bible underdogs, she would probably be a top seed, all right? She would be one of the number one seeds from from the Middle East, perhaps. She would represent that area. Um, And as we get into uh, her story, let's begin with Mary's song, all right? This is from Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 55. These are words that she, she put together for us. She says, My soul glorifies the Lord. My soul rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He's helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever even as he said to our fathers. Mary had an experience. She was in, in many ways a common young girl in, in a common, a very common village. But she had a very uncommon experience. I think we could call it a life-changing experience. And all of us will be presented with some of these moments throughout our lives, good and bad, that will change our life. A life-changing experience is one that is so significant that everything else that happens will be altered because of that experience. It is sort of a chain reaction. And in fact, the very kind of perspective or filter through which you see your world is changed through a life-changing experience. It could be losing a loved one to cancer. It could be surviving cancer. It could be finding the girl or boy of your dreams and getting married. It could be prison time. It could be stapling two of your fingers together. Did that when I was five years old. Still remember it like it was yesterday. Life-changing experience for me. It could be learning to read. It could be running a marathon. And as James knows, training for a marathon before you run a marathon. It could be living abroad. It could be learning to read. It could be teaching someone to read. It could be getting a college degree or getting a high school degree. It could be going through rehab. It could be getting baptized. It could be... um, Finally getting your hands on the remote control at your house, which, which I hope to have that someday as a life change. It could be starting your own business. It could be declaring bankruptcy. It could be, well, it most certainly, if you have a child, that will be a life-changing experience. It is something that alters everything else from this point forward. It is something that changes the way you see the world. Crystal Kelly, a young single mother in Hartford, Connecticut, had a life-changing moment just a couple of years ago. She was presented with a very unusual opportunity. And considering that she was struggling to pay bills and to buy groceries for her kids, it made sense to her. The opportunity was this. There was an agency that worked with surrogate parenting for families that have fertility issues. And she was given the opportunity to make $22,000 if she would carry this couple's baby to term. And she said, yes. So in October of 2011, she became pregnant through in vitro fertilization. And then halfway through what was up to that point a normal pregnancy, everything changed. She went in for what was supposed to be a a routine ultrasound. And it was discovered that the baby had, had issues. 
that the baby was not developing as the baby should have been developing. It was noticed that there were heart defects and there was a cyst on this baby's brain. A short time later, there was, there was yet another ultrasound to look at in more detail what was happening. And Crystal Kelly, with the parents of this baby standing behind her, was told by a doctor that this child would only have a 25% chance of, quote, a normal life. And over the coming weeks and months, she lived in a chaos and a confusion that would push anyone to the brink The parents of this child came to her and said, we believe that we need to terminate this pregnancy. That an abortion is the best option. They offered her $10,000 if she would just agree to terminate the pregnancy. But Crystal Kelly told them, she said, you called me out to, 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 to have this child growing in me because you knew that I would protect this child. And you knew that I would love this child as long as this child was in my womb. So, no, I'm not going to play God. I'm going to carry this pregnancy to term. Well, the parents told her, if you do that, then we will have absolutely nothing to do with this child. The deal is off. Eventually, as it became clear that she was going to go through with the pregnancy... The couple lawyered up and sent her a letter saying that she was obligated to terminate the pregnancy immediately. In fact, they were at the point in the pregnancy where legally she was going to have to have the abortion at that moment. Or she wouldn't be allowed to have it. But she could feel that baby in her womb squirming and kicking. And she loved that baby. And she said no. I won't terminate this pregnancy. In yet another twist in the road, the couple finally said, in the final month of pregnancy, we will take the baby once the baby is born, and we will immediately turn the baby over to the state of Connecticut. The child will be a ward of the state. And in Connecticut, the genetic parents have the legal rights. So Crystal Kelly moved to Michigan. In Michigan, the mother has the legal rights. When the baby came, Crystal realized, and we know the baby only is baby S for privacy reasons, a little girl. And when the baby came, Crystal Kelly knew that she was not best equipped to raise this child with all of this child's special needs. In fact, did have a number of medical problems. And so she worked with an adoption agency there in Michigan and found a loving couple who wanted this baby and who agreed to take on all that would be entailed by raising this child. And while some people may look at the couple that adopted baby S and see one picture, a baby born to a life of struggle and suffering, the parents of baby S see a baby who smiles, a baby who giggles, A baby who stares into the eyes of her mommy and daddy. They see a baby who eyes warily strangers who show up. They see a baby who is an underdog. Who's beating the odds. Who's surprising doctors with how well she is doing. Crystal Kelly's moment of life change happened when she decided no matter what, I am going To protect the child growing inside of me. Mary's life changing moment also involved a unborn child and and a a a trial of a pregnancy. I mean, her fiance Joseph decides to divorce her. The engagement was legally binding in those days, so so Joseph decides, I'm going to divorce her, but I'm going to do it quietly so as to protect her because as soon as she began to show the villagers would be talking would be gossiping and there would be ridicule and there would be difficulty for Mary but thankfully an angel appeared not only to Mary but also to Joseph and said no this child is of God remain true to your vow to marry this young woman and Joseph did that 
when the baby was born. So not only was the, the pregnancy a trial, but when the baby was born, the power in the region, King Herod, decided that he was going to target all of his military might to search and destroy the baby. So it was against all odds from a human standpoint that this baby was born, that this baby um, was born to Joseph and Mary, and that this baby survived the early years of his life. Baby Jesus, of course, was raised in his early years in Egypt as Mary and Joseph fled to Egypt to protect the child. So chaos, confusion, threats, and fear all swirl around Mary. But Mary refuses to lose faith. Mary refuses to give up on this promise of God for her and for the world. And after, I mean, think about this story. As you come into the Gospels, And this angel appears to Mary. Consider that God had been silent for 400 years. I mean, the last of the prophecies had been recorded. And God was quiet. And his people were wondering, what's the deal? I mean, we're being oppressed. Our nation has been shattered under the fist of Rome. And God says nothing. And then God speaks. God speaks in in some really surprising ways. I mean, Hallmark basically has, if you go to the Hallmark store, like there's one up close to my house, they have basically a greeting card for everything. I mean, you name it, there is a greeting card, right? They don't have greeting cards for this. They don't have greeting cards for the two pregnancies in Luke chapter 1. The first pregnancy is Elizabeth, who is way too old to be having any babies. She and her husband have never been able to conceive before, and now here she is with her walker and her dentures, and she's pregnant. Okay, Hallmark doesn't have a card for that. Hallmark, Hallmark doesn't have a section of cards either for the virgin pregnant girl, right? They don't have that section. But that's who, So you had one woman who is too old, one woman who is too young, and too unmarried, and too virginal to be having any babies. God speaks with an exclamation point in Luke chapter 1. You talk about having a baby as a life-changing experience. I mean, having a conversation with an angel... Is a life-changing experience. I mean, you know this throughout Scripture. Every time an angel shows up, a messenger of God to deliver, to de- deliver a telegram from heaven to somebody, the first words are inevitably, do not be afraid, because it is a scary thing to be face-to-face with an angel. Don't think little precious moments. Think something that will throw you on the ground and soil your britches, right? That's what an experience with an angel does. So this angel shows up and says, Mary, don't be afraid. In fact... Be the opposite of afraid. Be thrilled. The angel tells her, Mary, you, in Luke chapter 1, the angel tells her, her, Mary, you are highly favored. The angel tells her, Mary, you have found favor with God. The angel tells her about this baby. And the words become even more grandiose, even more epic. The the angel tells her in verse 31, Mary, you will give birth to this baby and he will be called Jesus. Verse 32, he will be the son of the most high. He will be great. He will reign forever. Verse 35, Mary, the baby who is going to grow inside of you is going to be, verse 35, the son of God. Incredible. And Mary asks quite naturally, how? I may be young. I may not have taken all the, the biology classes in Nazareth High School up to this point, but even I understand that virgins don't get pregnant. And you remember one of the most powerful verses, one of the most powerful phrases in all the Bible. The angel tells her in verse 37, Mary. Nothing 
is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. You can't experience the words of the angel Gabriel to Mary without sensing that there is something very special about this girl. There's just something about Mary. Something about Mary that allowed God to unleash his power. Allowed the God of possibilities to work in her world of improbabilities and even impossibilities. There's something about her that kept her moving forward in hope and faith, even when villagers were gossiping and even when a crazy king was hell-bent on the destruction of her baby. What was it about Mary that caused her to be highly favored, that caused her to be chosen by God? What was it that caused her to overcome the forces of doubt and the forces of darkness? That rose up against her. Mary was was favored by God. And I think there is a lot in that word. In that idea of being favored by God. Of walking in the favor of God. I think there's a lot in that. Way too much to unpack today. But what is it in my life that is possibly keeping me from the God, from the favor of God? What is it that's keeping me from experiencing him and his power in his fullness? What is it that, is, that, that could be released into my family, into my career, into my health, into my mission if I was to stand in the favor of God? See, Mary experienced chaos. She experienced All of this negativity around her. But she walked confidently in God's favor. In spite of everything. And so on your outline this morning in the the bulletin. I want to talk for just a, a couple of moments about walking in the favor of God. And specifically what we learn about that from Mary's experience. And particularly with the words that she writes down in Mary's song in Luke chapter 1. Walking in God's favor. Understand this. The angel said she was enjoying God's favor. Mary knew it. It wasn't an arrogant thing. But she understood. Yes, I am. In fact, Mary declares in verse 48. She says, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Yes, I am favored by God. And I believe that as as disciples of Jesus, bought by the blood of Jesus, with the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, we are favored by God. We enjoy His favor as well. So what does that look like? How do I walk in that? When, When I'm going through a disaster, or I'm on the other side of a disaster, when I'm beginning a new chapter in my life, how do I enjoy the favor of God? Just a few very simple ideas this morning. Nothing too new, but something we need, some things we need to be reminded of. The first one is this. Walking in God's favor for me means putting God's glory above all else. Putting God's glory above all else. And this is a life mission. That's what this is. In a world that tries to convince us to live for our glory, to put ourselves at the center of the universe, Mary found herself swept up in God's story, in his epic. And she began to orbit her world around God. Actually, I don't think... Luke chapter 1 is when she began to do that. I think she was already spending time with the Father, and that's one of the reasons she was chosen to be the one who bore his son. She writes in verse 46, My soul glorifies in the Lord. That's where I'm focusing my attention. That's where the glory needs to happen. My soul glorifies in the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God. So it's about putting the glory of God above all else. It's a life mission. 
That's bigger than just getting the, the, the new house or getting the promotion at work or seeing your kids go to an Ivy League school. It's God's glory above all else. The second thing is this. It's putting trust in God's words. Putting trust in God's words, no matter what. And this is a life fueled by faith. It's a life lived by faith in God, not living by sight, right? Living by faith. And that means believing God's word, believing that it's true, believing that it's right, believing that it's for me, not just for people thousands of years ago. Mary wrote these words, or actually Elizabeth speaks these words over Mary. Verse 45, blessed is she, blessed is Mary, who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. Blessed are you when you believe that what the Lord has said will be accomplished. Blessed are you, child of God, when you open the word of God, when you read scripture, when you meditate on scripture, when you memorize scripture, and you believe that what is written in here is true and defines your future, not the words of anybody else around you, but the words of God. And, Mary, and Elizabeth says, Mary, you're blessed because you heard some incredible things and you believed them. Because they came from the mouth of God. And then finally, walking in God's favor is about putting God's word into practice. Not just being a hearer of the word, as James will say, but a doer of the word. Putting God's word into practice. A life of power is unlocked by obedience. Right? A life of power is unlocked by obedience. Mary says, I am the Lord's servant. That means... I have a master. My life is about doing what my master tells me. Trusting in my master. Following my master. I am the Lord's servant, she says. May it be as you have said. I think obedience. I think obedience gets a bad rap. I really do. I mean, a lot of us grew up thinking about obedience like this. Do what God says or else. Walk the line or else. Obedience for many conjures up the image of a God who is waiting to pounce on them for a misstep. And I believe this is a fundamentally corrupt notion of what biblically obedience is. I believe it is an impoverished notion of biblically what obedience is about. So let me suggest this humbly this morning. What if obedience is not a curse? What if obedience is not something to be viewed as being hard and arduous and life draining? What if obedience isn't a curse? What if it isn't living under the heavy weight of impossible demands? What if obedience is rather the key that unlocks the favor of God? You know, Mary Mary wasn't bummed out that she had to obey God. That's not the feel of of Luke chapter 1. She was thrilled at the future she knew God was going to unlock for her as she believed and responded to his words. And in the end, not only would she be blessed, but we would be blessed through her obedience. She declares, my soul rejoices in God, my Savior. This is not a woman beat down by impossible demands. This is a woman whose soul thrills in obeying her mighty God. Because obedience is really about stepping into the blessing of God. That's what it's really about. Stepping into the blessing of God. It's about living out the favor of God. It's about trusting that Father really does know best. Right? 
And in every part of the Bible from beginning to end, God's word reminds us that obedience unlocks blessing from God. Right? Genesis chapter 22, verses 17 to 18. I'll bless you, God says. Oh, how I'll bless you. I'll make sure that your children flourish like stars in the sky, like sand on the beaches. And your descendants, this is the word to Abraham, will, be, will defeat their enemies. All nations on earth will find themselves blessed through your descendants because you what? Because you obeyed me. Obedience will unlock all of this. Luke chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus, the son of Mary, the son of God said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey. They're blessed. They're favored. Those who hear and obey. Job chapter 36, verse 11. If they obey and serve him, they will spend the rest of their days in prosperity and their years in contentment. That sounds pretty good to me. Obedience is sounding pretty good to me. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 28. Be careful to obey all these regulations I'm giving you so that the unlocking. So that it may always go well with you and your children after you because you will be doing what is good and right in the eyes of the Lord your God. So what about the perils of disobedience? Absolutely. When you understand that God is who God says He is, when you understand that Jesus is the Son of God, when you understand that He has the words of life, You know and you see that there is no life apart from God. Amen? God is life. He's the source of life. And we're not just talking about the creation of the world. God is the source of life. Separation from God is death. What that means for me, peril of disobedience. What that means for me is when I see what God has laid out for me, when I, when I see his word, when I see his will, and I choose to walk in another place, I'm walking toward death. It's very simple. When God tells me, honor your wife, honor your marriage vows, and I say, no thanks, going over here, it's death for my relationship. Part of me dies. When when I dishonor, when I disobey the way God tells me to raise my children to say, I know better, or I'm just not going to raise them. I'm going to let the TV and the friends at school raise them. I'm walking toward death. Unfortunately, I'm holding my children's hands as I walk. When I hear what God says for my finances, and I second guess it, and I come up with my own plan that's less than what he has for me, I'm asking for death in my finances. It's that simple. It's not that God is wagging his finger. It's that he is life. And when I choose to walk away, natural consequence is death. Of course, the ultimate natural consequence of that is eternal death, eternal destruction. Again, it changes everything when you understand this. For some people, God sending people to hell is like this malicious desire that he has. Oh, I can't wait to send people to hell. Although Jesus says in the Gospels, hell was not made for you. Hell was not made for people. It was created for the devil and his angels. However, heaven is an elective course. If you elect to do your own thing, if you elect to live separately from God... Out of his love for you, he will honor that choice. And there is no life apart from God. And so hell is something you choose. And God honors that choice. And yes, it's destruction. And yes, it's death. Because there's no way you can experience life in some place where he is not. Obedience 
is movement into life, is movement into favor, is movement into pres- the presence of God. Biblical obedience is joyful. Why? Because it's embracing the very best that God has for you. It's believing that the best version of you is going to be discovered in God's will, not separate from God's will. It's about God's best for you. And so if you believe God, if you believe that his kingdom is the best for you, this is faith. If you believe this, then obedience is fueled by your love for him and by your joyful belief that what he has laid out for you is for the best. James Bryan Smith, one of the best new Christian authors on the scene, writes this. In the same way that God's love is not a silly, sappy feeling but rather a consistent desire for the good of his people. So also the wrath of God is not a crazed rage, but rather a consistent opposition to sin and evil. It is a mindful, objective, rational response. God is not indecisive when it comes to evil. God is fiercely, fierce, fiercely and forcefully opposed to things that destroy his precious people. God is against my sin because God is for me. Mary didn't obey God out of a sense of dread. She did it out of love. She flat out loved God. And she believed him when God told her that what he had for her future was better than anything she could have on her own. When you're passionately in love with the father, and when you believe that his words are what are right for your life, you want to obey. You want to obey because you don't want to miss out on anything he has for you. Like Mary, you can say with a smile on your face and a bounce in your step, I'm the Lord's servant. I'm the Lord's servant. Remember Crystal Kelly, that young mother we talked about a few minutes ago. Because of a choice that she made and a life-changing decision that she faced, Life was born, not death. And baby S can giggle, can hug her parents and her older siblings, live in a loving family, and look forward to tomorrow. Because of a mom named Mary, and because she believed in some incredible words that an angel told her, The baby Jesus was born into the world. Her life was changed, but our life was changed because you know through Jesus and through his sacrifice, all of us would be invited into his family. Through Jesus, God showed us he wants to adopt us as his sons and daughters. And that's pretty incredible.